Welcome to Lab 15, Applications That Change the World. Today we're going to be talking about uh, primarily search, the problem of web search, how companies like Google are able to do that uh, the way we're used to and accustomed to these days, and some of the technologies that power uh, these breakthroughs in information discoverability. So if we start off here at the beginning, we're going to get an overview of some major ways that technology has changed the way we live in the past couple decades. Uh, there are a lot more ways than what's, what are discussed here, but it gives you a nice starting point and um, some, some food for thought in terms of thinking about how different life would have been had we been uh, 20 years older than we were, or 30 years older, or 50 years older. Uh, so if we go down here, after, after we read through this first section, we'll start focusing on search, which is what I'm going to go ahead and skip to. Search has become an increasingly powerful tool uh, as the internet has grown. And uh, some of this content will give you some background on how it works. I'll give you an overview on how search engines work uh, in terms of the problem. So. The really interesting problem with search is that you've got a ton of documents. The internet is absolutely gigantic. We actually have a graph a couple pages back showing the size of the internet over time in terms of the number of host names. So the number of domains uh, spikes up and active is lower but still increasing drastically. This is only up to 2009 and the internet's continuing to grow at a very, very fast pace. And then within each of these host names, target.com for example, more content is coming onto Target, more content is coming onto all the different websites uh, as, as the company moves further and further into the digital age. This is not only companies, but this is also people, um, new startups, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so the question is how on earth are we supposed to find something if we have all of these places to look and no real good way to navigate between them. The answer to that, at least the best we've come up with so far, is to search for it. And search is an interesting problem itself because these websites are stored on different computers in different parts of the world, sometimes all the way across the world from each other. So in order to look through all these sites every time someone puts a query, puts, types in a query, uh, we would have to wait a, a very long time and we'd have to depend on all of these websites to actually be able to respond to us within a certain period of time. This isn't something you necessarily want to have to do if you are in the position of Google or another search engine. You want to be able to make this a much faster and get rid of the dependencies of other websites on how quickly you're going to be able to produce results. So searching, if you get a query and just try and check all the websites at once, is totally uh, is a very infeasible way to actually execute a search. What you need to do instead, uh, the state of the art technique for this, is to build an index or a couple of indices to describe this information uh, in a in a place you can access it very quickly. So. Uh, for example, Google would have an index, and this is not the same as an index variable, like in the context we've been using it in the rest of the class, but an index that takes a bunch of words, let's say, um, fish, and connects that to a list of things, so a list of websites, excuse me. Oops. So you get some URL right here, we'll say URL1 right here. URL 2, right here, URL 3, and so on. So if someone types in an, the query fish, wants to know about it, instead of having to go out and check all websites on the internet, which would take forever, we can instead keep this structure on the computers at Google or whatever company's building this index, and then just look up the word fish and get this list of URLs that it comes from in addition to some other information. So this index makes it, this is the core, one of the core data structures that makes it possible to do searches in milliseconds instead of hours or days. Building this index though, 
requires a good bit of effort. And that's actually what we're going to look at today. How to build an index and then conduct searches on that index that are fast and responsive. So there are three parts of a search engine that we'll, we'll talk about today. The first is the crawler. The job of the crawler is to find web pages and save them and let's say download them. So you're going across the internet, any page you find that, that you want to index, that you want to have in your index, you're going to be downloading that and saving it for a little while back where the next step, the indexer, can access it. Note that downloading the whole internet is a pretty intense thing to have to do. And so uh, not all of this can be stored all the time. And so it might need to be done in waves or, you know, one way or another. These are kind of technical details. It's, it's harder than just downloading a bunch of web pages because of the number of web pages. Uh, not to mention that they may be updated hourly or m every minute or every second if it's something like Twitter. Um, but that's, that's what the crawler is going to be doing uh, in pretty much every situation. Trying to do the best it can at keeping fresh web pages coming in to be indexed. The indexer builds the index from crawled documents. So the stuff that's downloaded from the crawler is then processed, a whole bunch of computations done on it, and the output of that is an index. And then finally, the index is used for uh, searching. Here what we're calling this the searcher. And this uh, takes in a query, so receive query from user. and identify sites and in index that are appropriate for the query. So the nice thing about this, well, there's a lot of nice things about this. One of the really nice things is that this indexing part can actually be done in advance. So it could be run a long time before any queries come in. Then the searcher can just use that index, that pre-computed index, to perform searches really quickly. And tons of different queries can be used against the same index. And then as soon as you build a new index, you can just kind of swap out the old one with the new, more up-to-date one. And then searching can continue on that index. So we end up doing a lot of computation this way. But a lot of it can be done beforehand so that when we get to the part that really, where it really matters how long something takes, which is the searching, we can have a lot of that pre-computation pre done early and just focus on the parts that depend on the specific query once that comes in. Okay, so uh, crawler is going out to collect websites. Indexer is processing those websites to create a really uh, easy data structure to access. And then the searcher is doing the accessing on that data structure in order to answer the query that the user puts in. So one important thing to understand is the concept of a hash table. And, and this is something that's not only useful in search, but is just a very generally useful data structure to understand. Probably one of my favorite data structures, I would say. Uh, so the general idea behind a hash table, well, the reason you'd want to use a hash table, first of all, is because instead of a list like we're used to, which is indexed by numbers and then can store values, a hash table is similar, but is actually indexed by something other than numbers. It can be indexed by numbers, but it's usually indexed by words or, um, let's just say words for, for the time being. And then, so you could actually put in, instead of an index of one, item number one, you could get item Tom Stone is this value. So this w could be a phone book, for example, in this little 
corner here in the right. So we got Cleopatra's phone number if we want to look it up. Instead of having to go through each individual item, looking for which one Cleopatra's slot is, we can instead just use a, a mathematical formula to convert the word Cleopatra into the number four. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that, how the actual conversion from text to number works is a little bit out of scope for today. The technique is called hashing and there's actually a link right down here if you want to read the Wikipedia article about it uh, or feel free to ask your TA. Okay, but what we're going to do today is not so much hashing specific, we're just going to work with this data structure and see some of the ways that it uh, can be useful. So, we've got three primary operations. The first is to construct a hash table. There's a couple tips about how to do that here. Then we want to add the key and value to a particular hash table. So, in a list we have an index and then we have a value. The two concepts still exist in a hash table, but this outer value, the index, is now called a key. It's like a, a key to the door. You need to have the right key to get to the slot. So uh, the index in a hash table is referred to as a key. So here we want to add some new index, and this is going to be the value that's stored at it. Okay, And we'll give you these blocks. These blocks will already be built. And then this last operation, so this is how you add stuff, and then you f get stuff with this get value of key block. Note that you can't do deletions here. That is, so some hash tables allow it, but it ends up being a somewhat complicated procedure for for reasons we won't be discussing here today. Uh, but that's that's okay because the data structure we're building won't actually require any deletions. We're just going to build it once and then uh, just add a bunch of stuff to it and call it call it a day. Okay, we'll see that in action in just a minute. So here's a framework. I'm going to go ahead and download this. And Okay. So here's our three functions. They're already built. So you don't even really need to worry about what's going on in here. So we'll start off building a phone book, I believe. Yes, build an application using the blocks below that load a list of names and phone numbers and then allow the user to look up individual record listings as many times as they would like to. Okay. Open up phone book. First of all, we need to create a new hash table, which we'll do with this. You just pass in a list Ah, that's a pre-made one. Let's say numbers. This is our new phone book. Pass that in. The hash table of size, in case you didn't notice, uh, there are some sizes that are better than others. You actually generally want to make a hash table significantly larger than the number of items that you're storing in it. The, the definition we looked at over here said that um, a reasonably large prime number is a good idea. One that's typically about twice as large as the data you want to hold inside of it. So let's say 53 here. It's one of the examples that's given and that should be enough to store the data we need to store. Okay, 53. Now note that if you view numbers, you'll see that it's, it's still a list but it's got uh, a bunch of new stuff in it. We can watch what happens there. Again, it, it's a little out of scope to talk about exactly what's going where, but we can get a general high-level overview. Okay, so now numbers is a hash table. And let's add in good old Tom Jefferson. He has a phone, you know. And I believe, if I remember correctly, that was his phone number. Okay, so I added it, and it stuck it at slot 14, if you're looking at this list, which is 
kind of weird. But the 14 is what comes out when you hash this term, Thomas Jefferson, and convert it into a number. Again, out of scope for today, but all the code to do it is in here somewhere. Let's see. Yeah, it's all in here if you want to take a look at how it's done or feel free to ask. Okay. Now if we want to get a value, we can say Ted Walker from numbers. No answer. Because Ted Walker does not exist in here. However, if we look up Tom Jefferson, we'll get Tom Jefferson's phone number. An interesting th thing to notice is that even at, that even though the value Tom Jefferson is at slot number 14, we're not having to look through all the items 1 through 53 in this case in order to find it. Because Thomas Jefferson, when hashed, converts to the number 14, we're able to just hash this Tom Jefferson phrase here and say, oh, check slot 14, that's where it'll be. So that's the beauty of it. We'll see this in a little bit more of a practical application. Well, you can actually imagine how uh, this could work. If you just keep adding names, you can keep doing lookups, and it really turns into a very nice situation. Um, and this is going to come back to search in just a little while, by the way. Uh, and this is one of the core data structures that lets us get things with the speed that we need to. So the next activity in the lab, though, just before we get too far into it, is to provide or to build a hash table with complex data. So we'll build this off of what we had over here, uh, but the difference is going to be that instead of just storing a single phone number, we want to store a set of three phone numbers. There's the home phone number, the work phone number, and then the cell phone number. I'm going to reset the hash table too. So as you may or may not have had a lot of experience with yet, we can store lists inside of uh, of these slots just as well as we can store numbers inside of the slots. So if we use a list that has three elements in it, where the first one is home, second one is work, third one is cell, then we can just add that and put in numbers. I'm going to put short phone numbers now. Now Tom Jefferson. There he is, slot 14. Has a list stored within that slot. So then the question could be, how on earth are we going to get the cell number for Tom Jefferson? Well, get cell number of name. Then let's have from table. So the table is our hash table. I'm going to make that a list, since that's what it really is. And then this name is going to be just some text input, a key. OK, so what we want to do, if we're getting the cell number, which is the third field, we just want to use get name from the table. And this is going to report back a full list. So it would report back 145, 578, 345 in this case. But we want just the third slot of that. So we can do item 3 of, uh, there we go, item 3 of whatever is reported is the cell phone number. Three, four, five. There we go. Note that I did not do any error checking here. Uh, we wouldn't want to ask for item three in a non-list. So get get uh, value of field just returns blank if there is no if that person doesn't exist. So you probably want to check first for blank. And if it's not blank, then you can do the item three part. If it is blank, you can just return back another blank or say like. Uh, that person does not exist or something like that. 
So here's the cell number. You can imagine getting home number, work number, and you can start adding all kinds of new data to this. You can start adding birthday, uh, age, you know, t-shirt size, all those fun facts to know about. Presidents. Okay, and that pretty much wraps up our phone book application. Hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, you can keep trying to add people here, and you'll note that they're put in different slots. Uh, I wouldn't bother trying to find a pattern in where they're going. Look at the code if you're really interested in why they're being placed where they are. It's actually really fascinating, but uh, if you don't feel like doing it, uh, you know, it's not essential to understand at this point. Okay, so now let's move on to the big exercise. Our goal is to create a search engine in BYOB that can index and search through a list of quotes. Okay, they start us off with a framework here, and then we've got a crawler component, an indexer component, and a searcher component like we just saw uh, in when we were drawing earlier. So the crawler is done. It's got a list of quotes. Let's go ahead and open this one up. Here we go. So we've got a, a good number of quotes in here. You can try it with a subset of all these if you want. They're all going to be added to this input list when this block is run. So lists, uh, inputs, actually preloaded for us. How nice. Okay, so we've got a ton of text in there. The index doesn't really do a whole lot right now. This is our main component that we have to build. And then we've got search. That doesn't have anything either. This part's not so, it's not as bad though. The indexer is the main part. So let's look at the description a little bit to see what we need to be doing here. Most of the work is going to take place in the indexer and where most of the processing time will also be spent. So we need to create a keyword index that can be used to quickly determine which quotes contain which words. Okay, so it's kind of like a web page here. Uh, let's get out the drawing board. All right, so instead of having word pointing to website, websites, I should say, we're going to have word pointing to like a quote ID, let's say. And the quote ID will be the index of the quote in this big list. Uh, let's see, yeah, so here we've got a quote ID of one, quote ID of two, quote ID of three. And if we need to know the actual quote, we can just look into the inputs list and get the text. That'll just make it a little less storage. Instead of copying this quote each and every time, we'll just copy the number, and then we can go back and look it up in our inputs list if we need to. Okay, so that's our indexer. We need to build that. We use the hash table to store the data in a way that can be searched quickly. And remember that multiple quotes can be include can include the same word and we need to be able to locate all of those quotes. Okay, searcher. We're going to get a, a word as an input query, which is answer here. and we need to return the list of all the quotes that contain that word. All right, buckle up. So let's start, let's actually start with search in order to get a feel, a, a cleaner feel of what our index should look like. Search is going to be what's using the index, so if we build search, then 
we'll have a pretty clear idea of what needs to be an index in order for search to work well. Okay, so we get this word and we're looking at an index for it. What we need to find is the list of quotes that match, that contain whatever word comes in. Okay, so if we go back to this drawing that was just here, what we were talking about originally with the index was having a word that maps to a bunch of quote IDs. Given the exercises that we just performed in this lab, this is actually a really good um, use case for using a hash table. We've got a word, which could be our key, and then we could have a list of quote IDs over as our value in the table. So we need to, so if we assume that that's a hash table, that's, that's getting a clearer picture of what our index should look like. If it's a hash table, then we've got our same get value block. And we can just look for, the key is going to be word, and we're going to be looking in the index. This is going to give us a list of numbers, because remember we're storing quote IDs instead of the actual quotes. And let's call this uh, IDs. If we set IDs to the result of that, we're going to have a list that contains some number of numbers or a blank. That's actually good point. I'm glad you said that. Okay. If else, let's check to make sure that it's a list. If it's not a list, we will just say See what display results does. Okay. So we actually are supposed to be returning a list from this. If we look at display results, which is where the output of search goes, we'll see that it is looking at the length of search. So search should be a list. Oops, gosh. So if uh, the answer to that query of IDs, is not a list, then we can return an empty list. Otherwise, we need to convert that into some quotes and then send it along. So let's look inside here again. So length of search will say zero. The keyword you searched for was found in zero locations if we uh, don't have any IDs matching that word. If there are IDs matching that word, we need to run through and say, so number one, quote. The number two, quote. The number three, quote. So we do need to convert IDs into whatever the counterpart is in the inputs list. One super convenient way we could do that would be to use map. Map over all the IDs, and we want to get item whatever of inputs. So we'll take the number map it into the input list and then we're going to get a quote out of it. Then we just got to put back in our actual set IDs block so it actually gets some value. 
get the value of the key. This is just putting back what I had before, before I deleted all of it. There we go. Okay. So we're going to request this list from the index. If it's not a list, that means it wasn't in the index, so we don't really know anything about it. We'll just say zero results. If it is a list, the more interesting case, we're going to take all these IDs, map them, and actually convert them into the original quote, and then return that list of quotes to display results, which is going to say them out loud. OK. So that gives us a pretty clear description of what we need to be doing in the create index block. OK. So we start off with inputs, create index index, which is not a hash table yet. Uh, oh, we've got generating hash table here, so I guess that's... These are the three steps we need to build. Well, two steps, really. This last one's just telling us we got it done. So we want to convert whatever this is, which is still going to be blank, to a hash table. And we have 53 things, so let's go ahead and say 521, which I think is a prime number. Is that the example they gave us? Yes. OK. So make a hash table of size 521. And then our hash table will be generated. Then we want to build the index. So we need to take each word and map it through to whatever that input ID is. And the input ID will be a list. All right. To be or not to be. The word two, and let's say this is quote number one. Two should be a key and should map through to a list of numbers, which will now only contain one. OK. So what we're going to have to do, it makes things a little bit harder since we're going to be building this list as time goes on. So once we get down to quote 87, let's say that's the next time the word 2 shows up, we need to come back in to the same list and add 87 to it. So we can actually make another block off of this get value of key block called does key key exist no does key key exist in table okay so here we can pass in a key check to see if it exists in a particular hash table and get a true or false value from that so this is actually related to something we were doing earlier. If we pass in this table and we pass in this key, and if this is a list, then we report true. OK. So whenever this is true, we report true. Whenever this is false, we report false. So I'm just going to drop this in right here. Okay, so for each, yeah, okay. So let's pull a couple loops out here for this. First one is going to be words. We need to look, or excuse me, not words. We're going to look through each of the documents.
the doc ID, which will start at one. This will be our index. Then we also will need a word ID. So we're going to cycle through all these documents. And for each item, we're going to cycle through all of the words in that document. And let's say we'll remove the duplicates. So we want the length of, come on now, there we go, of item doc ID from our index. That's not true, from words. Yes, so we'll get item whatever of words, remove the duplicates from it, and then get the length of that. That'll be the number of words. Actually, let's also create a, um, since we're going to need the words themselves, let's create a list called uniques. And we will set uniques to this so that we can actually keep the words around too. We're going to need those words later. So the length of uniques is the number of things we're doing. And then with each word, we want to add a mapping back to doc ID. So in order to get the current word, let me add in a couple change blocks before I forget. Here we want to change the doc ID. Here we want to change the word ID. Okay. And we'll get item word ID of uh, uniques, sorry. So uniques is just going to be the list of unique words in this document. We want to get whatever word there and check a couple of different things. We want to check if the key exists First of all, if the key exists, then that means a record already a record already exists in the table, and we need to add this ID to the record instead of creating an entirely new record. So if the key, this term exists in the index, we just want to, let's see, get the value of that, that key and then add an item to it. So if we know the key exists, we can just get the list and add the doc ID to the item in the index. So there are a lot of parts right there. Let's look through it again. If the key already exists in the index, we want to get the list containing all those items, however many there are, and then just add the current doc ID to that list. Each doc ID should only appear once because we're removing duplicate words. And this is the technique for if the key already exists. If it doesn't exist yet, then we're not going to have a list in that slot. As soon as we add our first item, we need it to be a list from, from then onward, though. So that actually needs to be what happens down here in this else. We need to add, key, oops, add the key, this. to our hash table with the value 
list containing the doc ID. So a list with one element, which is doc ID. And that goes right in here. Bah, there we go. Okay. So let's run through this in our brains again before we try it out. We convert a hash table. It's probably not a great idea to have this size hard coded in there because if, if we were to get a list of quotes uh, that was, say, a thousand quotes long, then all of a sudden this wouldn't work anymore. Ideally, we'd have a larger number than that, but I we'd also have something to to generate prime numbers. We'd, we'd want a prime number that was at least twice as large as however many quotes we have in the ideal case. Here though, let's don't worry about it. We know we've got 53 quotes and 521 slots should be more than enough. Okay, so build the index. We've got a doc ID, starts at one. Then for each piece of content, we're going to go through and get the unique words in it. For each of those unique words, we're then going to walk through, check if that word exists in the index yet. If it does, we just add the current doc ID to that value, or to the, yeah, to the value. If it does not yet exist, then we'll add the key along with the first value associated with it, which is the current ID. Then increment the word counter, do that for each word, and then increment the doc counter and do it for each doc. And then by that point, our index will be finished. So this isn't going to be a particularly snappy process. It could take a little while, but remember, we don't have to do this each time we search. We do this one time, we get this data structure built where we can just look up a word and get a list of all the IDs for the quotes it appears in, and that's all the work we have to actually do whenever someone searches for a query. Okay. Now, I think we should be good to go. Let's find out. Let's actually turn on index. This will be fun to watch. Maybe I have a weird idea of fun, but see how it goes. Crawling sources. This is the part that we didn't have to do anything with. Just a bunch of quotes. This does end up taking a little while. I'm going to do some fast forwarding just so you don't have to sit here and watch the screen like I'm about to. All right, interesting tidbit. I actually miscalculated one of the things we were talking about earlier. Um, you may have noted if you tried to run it that it started to slow down a whole lot once you got up into the 400s range. This was because we used a hash table size of 521. And what I had in my mind at the time was that we were only going to need one slot per quote meaning that we had about 10 times more slots than we needed. Turns out we need one, one slot per word, which turns out to be a lot more slots. And we remember, we want about twice as many slots as we would have otherwise, or as we actually need. So in this case, we have, we're starting to reach saturation, like our, our hash table is getting filled up, and it's going to become a lot slower to add and look stuff up. So I think it's probably in our best interest to actually start this over with a larger size. So I'm just going to look up um, first 20 prime numbers. Uh, 20 is not going to be enough. List of prime numbers. The Wikipedia page. Whoa. Yeah, so let's do 2381. Your guess is as good as mine there. We could count the number of distinct words. We could even write a quick program to count the number of distinct words. You know what? That's just crazy enough to work. Map. 
combine. So we want to take our inputs and create a list out of each one. So let's say sentence to list. And then we want to remove the duplicates. And then we want to count length of that. How many unique words are there in this? So this will give us, actually you know what would be even better. This would give us an approximately correct answer. But if we get the actual list. Yes. Let's get all the actual words. Then we want to combine them with append. Remove the duplicates and get the length. Whoa. Okay, so convert each input to a list of words. Combine all those with a pen, so we just get one gigantic list of words. Remove the duplicates from that list, and then get the length. That's the number of unique words we're going to have. And... Let's set a variable to this just in case the little flag goes away. Let's say number of words, just for our notes, not to actually use anywhere. OK. Now we're going to let that compute for a little while. Again, if it takes too long, I will do some fast forwarding for you. All right, there we go with a grand total of 414 unique words. So 2,300 should be plenty. In fact, I might look for a smaller prime, the neighborhood of 1,000, 1039. You are the lucky number. OK, so that should work a lot better this time. Twice as large of a hash table. Uh, and I guess we'll just start that one over. One thing we did not do, however, is actually wait. Convert. OK, yes, convert clears everything out of the hash table automatically. So we don't need to do anything except say Okay, once again, I will be fast forwarding. Um, I'm actually going to hide this list, hide both lists, and turn on turbo mode just to speed things up a little bit. And we'll fast forward to the end. All right, there we go. Not too bad there. About two minutes run time for me. Uh, so now we can search for a keyword. Let's say if. Found in zero locations. OK. It's an unusual used list of quotes. Not. Three locations. Nice. Nice, all of those had not in it. Let's see, living. Very nice. OK, it's looking like this is working. Fish. Perfect. So one thing to note is that I expect, yes, case sensitivity is going to be an issue here, as well as punctuation. So you need to actually search for the, the terms in the correct capitalization state. And in addition, punctuation is going to be left there as well. So I just searched for I, nothing sh um, showed up. However, if I search for capital I, I'm going to get two. 
There's a couple of ways you could get around this. You could implement this if you wanted to. We probably won't do it today, but you could simply lowercase all the words that you index, and then lowercase all the terms that come in through the search query. Um, that's probably the most straightforward way to do it. In uh, the case of punctuation, you probably just want to strip all of that out anyway. There's no reason not period should be different than not. Um, and there's a couple of other variations that you could make here that could improve search a little bit, but as you can tell, it's able to go really quickly. This is the part where it's just accessing that hash table. So uh, every all the real hard computation has been done, and it's pretty much just a lookup into a table that lets us look up pretty darn quickly. All right, now if I bring this back. Uh, that wraps up this activity. There are a couple of challenges here at the bottom it, that allow you to improve your search engine if you'd like to. Some of them are pretty challenging. Some of them are relatively straightforward. Number three is removing punctuation like we were just discussing. So feel free to tackle any of those if you want on your own. And that wraps up today's lab, Applications That Change the World, where we learned about hash tables as well as the search process. All right, well, hope that was helpful, and we'll see you next time.